Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning is our second lesson from Hebrews chapter 10, and during the course of the sermon we'll refer to the verses of our text and read a verse and a half of it together in just a few minutes. In the name of our Savior Jesus Christ, who will come again the same way his disciples saw him go into heaven, visibly, and he will come to take all his people to be with him forever. Dear Christian friends, I know in the past year some of you have had the opportunity to travel overseas. And I'll confess I'm a little bit jealous. I haven't done that yet. My family had, well, Margot's done that, but, but, but my daughters haven't done that yet. But, but that's okay. You know, there is an awful lot to see in this country. And by God's grace, maybe you've seen some of the wonderful sights that, that there are to see in our country, sights that attest to the power, the imagination, and, and the love of our God, and that he would give us these things to look at. Have you been to the Grand Canyon? You can literally stand on the edge of the Grand Canyon for hours and not say a word and just soak in with your eyes this awesome expanse, a sight you just won't see anywhere else in the world. Christian scientists will tell you, too, that, that, that the topography of the Grand Canyon is actually a proof for Noah's flood because it couldn't have been carved out the way it was carved out by the Colorado River slowly over a long period of time. The strata also testify to a cataclysmic event that happened very quickly. And what it's left us with is something that's beautiful and awe-inspiring. Or from the Grand Canyon, just go straight north to Rocky Mountain National Park. Oh, the, the contrast of the valleys and mountain lakes with the mountains themselves and, and the way the hue of the blue sky plays against the white-capped mountains. There's a reason people go out of their way to go to Colorado. The fresh air, the pure water. And you think, if God made this, he must be a very, very big God to be able to move mountains and put them right where he wanted to put them. Or head a little bit west from there, or I'm sorry, go back east if you want to talk about the power of God and look at Niagara Falls. Whether you're at the Canadian side or the American side, feel the mist of the falls against your face. I can tell you, in winter, it's a pretty biting mist. It actually stings you. But, but you can't stop looking at it. And yes, it's a grace of God that we've been able to harness part of the power of Niagara Falls for, for, to make hydroelectric electricity. But people don't go there to see the power plants. They, they go there to see the water cascading over the cliffs. And that's, again, one of those sights that you just look at, take in, and cherish that you were able to see it. What about the living things, though? Go all the way out west to California and see the sequoias, the oldest living things on earth. Some of them more than 4,000 years old, and you can stand right next to them even while they are still living and growing. And you can be amazed that God engineered them in such a way that they could live so long and be so big. And yet you truly don't have to travel far or look at something huge to see an evidence of God's creation and Signs of God's love in that creation. Just look at something as simple as a flower. Or consider a number of flowers together and the seemingly infinite variety of shapes and textures and scents and, yes, colors that God put into flowers. Well, think of these things. Think of all the natural beauty that there is there in creation. And then ask yourself, when God's looking down at his creation, what aspect of creation does he say, wow, I really did do a good job on that? What's awe-inspiring to God? What moves him when he sees it, even though he made it? The natural wonder that moves God is his most wonderful creation of all, human beings. 
the amount of thought that he put into every single one of the billions of human beings, you included, that walk around on this earth is absolutely staggering. Just that long ago, we finished reading a book that talked about the, the, the intricacies of the human brain, the capacity that God has put in the human brain, and that's just one aspect of, of our being. There aren't animals who walk around looking around and saying, I wonder how I got here. I wonder what happens to me when I die. But human beings do. There aren't animals that walk around and can arrange the other parts of creation in such a way that make things as useful I mean, as human beings can. But I don't know about you. I have to confess, though, that when I see a large number of human beings. My first thought is not always, wow, what an amazing bunch of God's creatures. If I'm walking around the state fairgrounds or, or trying to get to my car after a ball game, I see a whole bunch of people and I see a bunch of obstacles between me and where I want to go. And I also understand that the rest of the people as individuals are probably looking at me and everyone else and thinking the same way thing. These are obstacles getting in the, in the way of me getting where I want to go. I see a large crowd of people. That's often what I think. How am I going to get through that large crowd of people? Or when it comes to individual people, sometimes there are individuals that we're not really happy to see. We're not happy to hear from. Maybe it's because they irritate us. Maybe it's because they have or continue to hurt us. And we have a hard time then looking at them and saying, wow, that, you, you are really an amazing creature, or an amazing creation of God. Because that's not what we're feeling about them at any given time. Our text, though, would direct us to think about how Jesus considers all people and what he did for all people. Because when our text says that he made one time a sacrifice, he made that one time sacrifice for all. For the vast crowd of humanity that inhabits this planet. For every person as an individual as well. Let's reread the last half of verse 17 and verse 18, as it's printed on the screen here. Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. It's funny, someone just came to me this past week and said, Pastor, um, when I forgive someone, do I have to forget about it too? I said, well, it'd be good if you can, but I can only speak for myself. I can't. I remember a lot of things. And even after I forgive someone, I do remember what happened. Maybe you're kind of the same way too. You forgive someone, but you still remember what happened. That can actually be a good thing in a way because if, you, if someone does steal your car, you will remember, even though you've forgiven them, to lock your car the next time that you park it somewhere. At the same time too, God tells us he has the ability to do what we can't. He can forgive and forget. Remember, I will remember their sins and lawless acts no more. He has the ability to purposefully put them out of his mind. And he does so because there has been a sacrifice for sin. Not a series of sacrifices, a sacrifice for sin. For sin. Well, when we're talking about the sacrifice for sin, we are sort of reviewing what we had talked about a few weeks ago when we considered the picture that Hebrews gives us of Jesus as our high priest. And he's mentioned again as such in our text. Jesus is our priest. The comparison point, though, is to Jesus as priest and to, to all the Old Testament priests and what they were told to do. We briefly touched on it in Bible study this morning. We're going to talk about it in more detail next week, too. So be there for that. Uh, the Old Testament priests were told exactly what they were supposed to do and when they were supposed to do it, and how often they were supposed to do it. They did it, as our text says, day after day, again and again. Again. 
maybe it feels sometimes like what our worship can feel like too, that we do some of the same things Sunday after Sunday, again and again. Not to say there isn't value in repetition, but we don't put any hope in the fact that we're repeating the same thing over and over again. Day after day, again and again, the sacrifices were performed by the priests, and our text points out that none of those sacrifices actually did anything. Instead, they were symbols. God commanded them to go through with the symbolism, but the sacrifices themselves were symbols that pointed forward to the one sacrifice that the great high priest would make. One sacrifice. So there's no more sacrifice that needs to be made, as the words that we just read said. There's nothing else that has to be done. And our great high priest was willing to do that because he looked out on the vast sea of humanity and he saw not one big blob of people, but he saw a bunch of individuals and he loved every single individual and was willing to shed his blood for them. Of course, what do the vast majority of people for whom Jesus shed his blood do with the gift that Jesus gave them? Most of them turn their back on that, on Jesus. But before we get on our high horse and say, oh God, I thank you that I'm not one of those. I thank you that when you come down and judge and you send some people to heaven and others to hell that there's no chance I'd ever go to hell. And thank you for that. Let's think about the times that we have turned our back on God. And we have. Every single one of us has turned our back on God. And I'm not talking about that time in our youth when we started to question things and maybe fell away from the church for a few years and then came back. Well, that can certainly be part of it. I'm talking about what's going on right now. When we sin against our better judgment, when we harbor in our hearts room for sin and say, yeah, I know who God is and what he says and that's all good, but I really want to do this. I really want to say this. I really want to get this emotion out. I really want to acquire this which I ought not to have. We turn our backs on God. And we say, God, maybe I'll turn back to you later, but right now I really don't want you. I really don't want what you have to say. But in his love, God wasn't willing to have us turn our backs on him and just leave things that way. He came down to pay for everyone's sin, whether they continue to turn their backs on him or not. And it is that proclamation of the message that sins have been paid for that finally makes people turn and say, this is what I need in my life. I need a Savior. I need the comfort that comes only from God's Word and the knowledge of what He's done for me. I mean, it is true. You know, nobody's perfect, right? We, we say that, and we, we know what we mean when we say it. Nobody's perfect. We can use that, though, as an excuse for when we commit sin. So how, how can you judge me? Nobody's perfect, right? Everyone makes mistakes. So, so what if I did this to you? So what if I didn't do what I said I was going to do for you? Nobody's perfect. Quit judging me. But did you catch what our text said about perfection? <coughs> By one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The verb tense there in the Greek is called an aorist, which means completed action. He has made perfect forever. The act of him making us perfect is done. We are perfect. And we're going to be perfect forever. 
Now, I hear that, and I look at my life and say, I got so many evidences to the contrary, God. I can tell you how I'm not perfect. I can tell you what I do wrong. Well, that's where the last part of the verse comes in. Those who are being made holy. I mean, more and more the Holy Spirit works in us. More and more the Holy Spirit gives us faith, confidence, and then the determination to do what God says. That's an ongoing process, but in God's eyes, we are perfect. Every single one of us is perfect. Because God looks at us and he sees only perfection. He has chosen to forget about everything that we've ever done wrong. Every word that we've ever said out of anger or hatred. Every impure thought we've let enter our heads. He has chosen to forget about all that. And instead he's going to look at us and he's going to see Jesus and Jesus' perfection instead. And so he looks at you and he says, you are perfect. And he has us look at the casket in the front of church and think of the person who died and remember what God thought of them. They were perfect. And perfect people have to go to a perfect place, right? So now I understand that I can't look into everyone's heart and know what you truly believe, but in a few minutes we're all going to confess the Nicene Creed together. And assuming you believe what it says, that you believe that, that by that sacrifice you have received this cleansing from your God, you are perfect. Everyone who comes to church, who kneels before their God in prayer, who confesses Jesus Christ is perfect. And that changes how we look at each other, doesn't it? You may sin against me, and I may sin against you. But because we know who Jesus is, when we look at each other, we see people, fellow Christians, who have been perfected, who have been forgiven. We'll try to help each other live better lives, yes, yeah, spur each other on towards love and good deeds, as the writer to the Hebrews says in, the next, in chapter 13, but we still proceed down our Christian walk looking at each other as perfect. Perfect because Jesus paid the price for us. Perfect because Jesus said, I'm going to make them perfect. Perfect because Jesus perfect God and perfect man in one perfect being spilled his perfect blood which washed us perfectly clean. And yes, not only does that change how we think about each other, it changes how we think of the people that we encounter here in this world. Next time you see a big crowd of people, try not to see the crowd. But try to see a whole bunch of individuals amazing creations of their heavenly Father, whether they, recognize it or, whether they recognize it or not. Washed clean in the blood of Jesus, whether they know it and believe it or not. Someone whom their God loves. Someone whom you can love too. Because their Savior is our Savior. And what our Savior did for us, he did for them too. One time, on Calvary's cross, he made a sacrifice that paid for the sins of all. Amen. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.